So welcome, guys. Um, I'm, I used to work for Channel 4 News for many years. Um, Lionel used to be a regular guest uh, on Channel 4 News. And it's, it's really interesting. I was sort of thinking, and I, we, we didn't get to this point, Lionel, but we were talking before about kind of our political leanings. And I, I, I don't necessarily define myself on the political spectrum at the moment much because I'm not really sure where I am. But I sort of feel I've always, I would always have defined myself as left wing and certainly over the last five years or so would probably describe myself as politically homeless. And I know Tim has appeared quite a few times on our channel. We've done a few events together and I know that you define yourself as on the left as well. But you also feel very strongly about this topic, about this sort of sense that there is an ideological frame that is very um, unidimensional, and you're worried about how that affects, um, how that can affect art and affect literature in particular. But I didn't get to the point, so I'm interested to ask, what, how would you consider your political views, um, or your, yeah, where would you place yourself on the political spectrum? Um, well, in desperation, uh, a few years ago, I came out <laughs> as a libertarian. Uh, out of not my inability to find any other word that quite describes where I come from, I am frustrated by the whole categories of left and right right now. Um, if they were ever useful, they're certainly no longer. Uh, when you've got um, on the on the left. Uh, uh, censorious authoritarianism and on the right pounding on about freedom of speech something's got quite confused <laughs> so um, the main principle of libertarianism is just that we should be able to do whatever we want as long as it doesn't hurt other people and I think that's a pretty good principle it's certainly the founding principle of the United States I, it's not one that the US uh, adheres to very well right now I don't think any any country in the West of really believes that you should be able to do whatever you want if, unless you hurt someone else. But uh, that means that I'm not big on um, state control, I'm, um, and I'm not big on censorship, and I believe in freedom of speech, uh, even if it means uh, letting people say atrocities. So just to, to lay out the, um, how we're going to run the event tonight, we're, we're going to talk until about 8.30. We're going to take a break of about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then we're going to come back for an audience Q&A. So anything that comes to mind while we're talking, just file it away, and there'll be an opportunity after the break to, to ask questions to, to any one of us. And I'm also going to encourage Tim and Lionel, if you want to pick up on each other's points, and um, I'll take myself out completely of the, of the conversation. Um, but I, when, when thinking about this, I, I'm kind of very aware with my, as a journalist that we're, we're in quite increasingly sort of dicey territory and increasingly controversial territory. So there was some thought about, in the back of my mind, whether we should have someone from the other side, as it were. Um, and then I sort of, I, I was very aware of that process in myself of, of, this is the kind of topic that, that we need to have both sides represented. Um, so I'll do that. I'm, I've, I've got some of the, the criticisms that have been made, especially of your views on cultural appropriation. So I'll, I'll play sort of devil's advocate at some point in the, in the evening just to, just to put those to you. Oh, good. I come here to have insults read to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think one of the points to start on is, so we called this the war on art, and obviously we want people to come to our events, we choose a kind of slightly kind of inflammatory title, a little bit clickbaity, and that's often one of the big uh, comments made about this, that these, these views are pretty much just limited to a few college campuses in America, it's, it's, a, it's kind of straw manning the opposition, this is not a mainstream view, so it's a lot of people getting excited about nothing. Uh, what do you make of that? I think there's some truth to the observation that there's a shrill minority that is getting control of the public conversation, and that's why we, I assume we do events like this, um, to give a little pushback. 
I think, for example, that the so-called millennial generation has been broadly misrepresented because in my experience, I meet a lot of younger people who um, are quite reasonable and, as you were asked to be at the beginning of this event, open-minded. Um, they don't uh, they don't have opinions like uh, a, like some kind of subscription, and they're thinking people. And this authoritarianism I mentioned is coming from a minority which is really all about bullying and um, it's all this all this calling out all the shaming all the name calling all the labeling it's combative and aggressive that's one of the ironies of their being so concerned with microaggression what you're really dealing with serious major macroaggression um, sometimes uh, with the express intent of losing people their jobs um, and making them roundly unemployable thereafter so I don't think it's fair to represent a whole generation this way. Um, but I, I, on the other hand, I would also say that it has spread far beyond the college campus. Because um, you, we were just talking about that uh, before this event got started, the fact that um, both The Guardian and The New York Times uh, have changed in character drastically in the last five years, especially in the last two with the, with the whole Trump phenomenon and uh, have given over to a much more activist, indignant quarter, and have lost a, a, a lot of integrity in the process, any, any pretense of neutrality, of, of fairness, and, and, and any awareness of the, the fact that you have, that in, in straight reporting, you're not supposed to be having an every paragraph. So I've, I've watched, you know, that's, these are people who have graduated from college, and um, and and I do feel that there's a whole larger cultural set of attitudes that are now becoming commonplace and have spilled into the mainstream. And they do it. Do, it did start out from college campuses, but it's not that little anymore. Because I guess this is one of the, the the big points. If you sort of take a big picture view that the left, a lot of the, the freedoms of speech that we have now were fought for by the left in the 60s. There was sort of the obscenity trials, there was the sense of pushing back against a very stifling conformity in the, in the 50s and early 60s, and the left, like the free, the free speech movement in Berkeley was a left-wing movement for quite a while, and now we, we sort of are through the looking glass in some way where the left seems to be the, the, the cultural force that's pushing for saying, you can't say certain things, you can't have certain attitude, you can't wear certain clothes. Um, what do you make of that, Tim? It's kind of confusing, and it puts you on the back foot. And I think that's part of the way it's designed. Um, it's certainly true that, like Lionel, I sort of grew up at a time when... I don't know if I would use the word libertarian, because it's become associated with an economic view of the world as well, libertarianism. And I don't think that's what Lionel means by it, and, and it, maybe she does, but I mean, it's not what I mean by it. But I certainly... not obsessed with the Oh, you're not? Okay. Thank you for bringing me up today on that. Um, uh, but um, I think the idea of individual liberty is very deep within me, both as a writer, because I'm a novelist mainly, and like Lionel, and... If I don't have the freedom to, to experiment with my thoughts um, on the page, then I don't see the point of doing my job at all. Um, there's no point. And if I can't put that stuff out there and have it received into a climate that will give it a chance uh, and won't try and force it into a particular ghetto, um, then I, 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 you know, that really worries me. Let me just talk to that point that you said about, you know, whether it's just a, couple, a small number of left-wing activists that, in fact, it's a, a straw man. There's no real problem with that. I, I, you know, I really, really can't agree with that. So I think it's getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and one sees it every day. And it's a process that's been going for a long time, and it goes back to the satanic verses. 
which was the first time I remember I was sort of thinking, Jesus Christ, what is going on here? And why aren't liberals defending it? Why are so many liberals turning against Salman Rushdie when he was being pursued after the Satanic satanic verses? The same sort of thing happened amongst writers in America after the Charlie Hebdo slaughters in which something like, I can't remember the terrifying number of writers, so-called free speech writers that that refused to turn up to the award ceremony for Charlie Hebdo being awarded. 200 writers, you know, that... Pen Awards. I mean, that shocked the hell out of me and depressed the hell out of me because what are we talking about? The bravery of those those people on, on Charlie Hebdo was staggering. Whatever you think of their, you know, and they were scurrilous, but that's that's good. I, I approve of scurrilousness. Um, I was really shocked by that. I was very shocked by the sort of conservative strand that has has developed within what used to be thought as the kind of left liberal strand. And I'm much more, you know, I am left liberal, but I, I incline more to the liberal than to the left. And uh, I think it's, we're seeing it only today there was a story about... Uh, <laughs> so I couldn't quite get my head around it. I just sort of saw it before I came out, so I didn't digest it entirely. There was a story about a museum in Northumberland that was having a, 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 an exhibition of the wife of, a, of an industrialist there, or, or, or a, uh, and uh, he, was, uh, he was the father of not modern modern artillery, if I remember correctly, and uh, they wanted to do something to celebrate his wife at this stately home, but they couldn't find anything that would celebrate his wife, so. In order to acknowledge her, they simply denied him, and they went away around and put pillowcases around over all the busts of men, and sheets over the paintings that were about men or by men. Basically, they covered everything up. It looked as if they were moving out. <laughs> and uh, it backfired, surprisingly. So families paid forty nine ninety five to go look at a bunch of Sheets. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's just one. You know, that's today. You know, and that's that's just one aspect, and it's it's just it's going on all the time. And the effect of it has, I mean, that's that's an effect that it has on museums, but the effect it has on artists generally, I think, is very very pernicious in so many ways. Some of them formal, some of them informal, some of them interior, some of them exterior. I think that the main enemy for, for, for artists is, is, I mean, being a writer is an incredibly insecure profession anyway. But the, 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 the temptation now to try and fit yourself into some preordained market, which you could substitute the word ideological position, because that's what sells and that's what's acceptable and that's what you know publishers, crucially, are going to be interested in because publishers are very, very influenced by this climate at the moment and they have now something, I believe, called sensitivity readers. Lionel, you know about them, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, the, um, this uh, started out in the children's literature and uh, young people. Uh, literature, uh, and it's, it's actually the publisher that hires the sensitivity readers. So you send your book in, and before they publish it, they send it to somebody. If you've included um, any characters that are uh, you know, people of color or disabled, or and they've got all, a whole bunch of categories. There, there are many more than you, you might think of. I, I got. They even have sensitivity, river, sensitivity readers. For, for people with terminal illnesses. <laughs> I, maybe they don't last long. <laughs> I have no taste. Um, and and th these readers are paid to comb through your manuscript and find a, a, a fence. It is, they're, they're paid to be offended. And and point out where you might be stereotyping or where this is going to be upsetting to this group. And this is, you know, um, and, you know, I find the whole thing obnoxious. 
it hasn't spread uh, uh, in it to any considerable degree to adult literature that I know of yet, but it seems to me that it's only a matter of time. Um, and the day that Harper Collins sends my novels to a sensitivity reader is the day I switch houses. Because I, I think this is a really important point, is like, I'd, I'd like to hear from both of you what your specific concerns are. I remember reading that you, one of your recent, uh, some of your recent writing, your agent questioned the fact that you'd, you'd, um, one of your characters was, was black, is that right? And the, the, the book wasn't picked up. Oh, it was actually just a short story, but, um, you know, I, uh, I've taken on the cause of freedom of speech out of self-interest. Uh, it's not because I'm a nice person. I'm not a nice person. Um, but uh, this uh, identity politics movement has started to hit me where it hurts, and that's not just in my journalism, but especially in my novels, and that's when I say enough is enough. Now, uh, white writers have been put in a very awkward position of, of, of where they can't win, because on the one hand, there's this new... Uh, cultural appropriation nonsense where you're told that uh, people people's experiences uh, outside your own you know if they're black or disabled or even I suppose the other gender um, doesn't belong to you and so you have to keep your hands off that's a kind of stealing so uh, that means I suppose that your whole cast has to be set as if it's in the, still in the 1950s and everybody's white. And it's a kind of literary apartheid. Uh, but then you get criticized for not reflecting diversity. So this is a losing proposition. And I would say one of the most important things we need to emphasize here is that these rules coming down from on high, we don't have to obey them. They only, they only have force if we comply. So, shortly after I gave a, a, a speech on cultural appropriation, decrying the concept in Brisbane, Australia, I submitted a short story to my agent uh, and asked her to send it uh, to The New Yorker. And um, she said, well, I just want to warn you, you've included a black character here and so much on the heels of that speech, which got a lot of blowback you're going to have a much better chance of being accepted if you change this girlfriend you've been... It was just a secondary character. Uh, make her white. And I wouldn't. There were reasons in terms of the story and the characters that it, that it added something that, that she was black. And, um, and the odd thing is, you know, it's a fun character. It's somebody who's portrayed as very smart and lively and appealing and... Um, and uh, even, you know, economically not stereotypical. She's from an upper middle class uh, background. She's, she's de definitely got the wealthiest background of anybody in the story. It was set in Atlanta, so that's actually quite credible. It has one, one of the largest black um, wealthy communities in the United States. Well, of course, the New Yorker rejected it, and it's entirely possible that it was rejected because the story sucked. It's in my new collection, Property, since I can plug new collection. Um, and it's called Domestic Terrorism, and you're welcome to uh, judge for yourself, whether it sucks. Um, but I don't like this new self-consciousness about including characters who are different from me. I don't want to have to look at them twice. I mean, I'm, I find, and I am. I'm looking at them more than twice. Uh, the book I'm writing now includes a couple of uh, black characters, and I know they're going to be scrutinized uh, to a minute degree, because that story, when it came out, um, was indeed uh, examined on a line-by-line -line basis when it had to do with, with anything to do with this one black character. And by the way, if there's anything in this regard wrong with that collection, is that it, it is too white, you know? It is too much people by people like me. So, um, I find, I, I don't like the self-consciousness. 
I don't like the the stay in your lane nonsense. I don't like to be told that you know I am not allowed to use what we we're now supposed to call A A B E or African American vernacular English, um, which would mean, by the way, that we would not have the series The Wire, we wouldn't have the movie or the book Quackers, both of which are brilliant. We wouldn't have homicide life on the street. I mean, if you want to start making a list of the number of, of books and, 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 and television and, and movies that we would not have if we didn't allow uh, writers to use the vernacular of, of, of other groups of people, it, 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 it would be huge. And who wants to live in this restricted universe? Who wants to write this way? It's joyless, it's boring, and it's boring for the reader. So uh, I just think we should push back, and I think reader, writers have to push back. And not, because one of the things that's going on right now is a lot of self-censorship. And I think there are, I feel that if I'm the one who's suddenly self-conscious, someone like me who is pretty bullshy, if I'm uh, anxious about having a, a diverse cast, then uh, a lot of other writers I know who are a little more timid are, 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 are controlling what they write to an even greater degree. And I think that's where the danger with this movement is. We're not dealing with laws. We're not dealing with legislation which is telling novelists what they can and cannot write. But when you comply with rules, they have effect. Tim, are you more timid than Lionel? This, just to pick up on... Yeah, just to pick up on one thing, this, this is very paradoxical, that the outcome of this kind of, this worldview is that there may be fewer, um, as, as Lionel said, it's almost like, like a kind of literary apartheid. Like if you can only write about your experience, then suddenly you filled your books up with, with, with only white characters or only characters who um, look exactly like you. Uh, I mean, it goes beyond that. It goes on, it goes on to how the characters are, betray are portrayed. Not just about who you betray. Portray, not betray. Um, I mean, my description of a novel, which has got... Um, uh, it's got a number of gay characters in it, um, so I'm representing, in some sense, nominally, gay experience. And, of course, it's one of the main characters is... is uh, two of the main characters are women, so I'm representing the female experience. And... The temptation or the, or the fear is that you, you have to, or you're going to be required to represent these characters, let's say the gay guys in previous books, I've written black characters, um, in a positive light, that they have to be shown as the good guys or the, or the good women. You know, and I really kick against that because everyone's an asshole. You know, that's my fundamental statement about human nature. You know, there are no virtuous people. Uh, you know, ultimately, everyone's capable of all kinds of aggression, hypocrisy, foolishness, fear, ugliness, envy. This, this, this is part of us all. And, and to sort of dress up characters as being artificially virtuous, you know, it just doesn't ring true because, because that's not the way people are and whatever group they belong to. So there's always a certain air uh, of nervousness. For instance, I, I, you know, the, in, the, the woman in my new novel um, is, uh, well, you could say she was, she was abusive to the man, um, which is not something you often see in books. One of the gay guys is just a twat, basically. It's not, sort of, not a likable guy at all. He's a horrible old queen. You know, and, um, uh, and, you know, all I can do in trying to get that stuff right is, is, is talk to people. You know, I, I you know, in, in order to portray, I was portraying the gay scene in the early noughties. It's just I went to speak to as many people I knew who were gay who'd been around that time and just say, well, what was it like? What's the vibe? What's the, what's, what do you go through as a gay man? I research it, you know, and I think that's what writers do. If they're good, they don't just sort of make it up, which is the difference between somebody with prejudices. They go out to try and find out 
what it is about that particular group that makes them particular. And I think that's what you should do. If you're just writing from <clears throat> laziness, then, the, then I can see that there would be some weight to the argument that you were just lazily portraying stereotypes. But so long as you're going in there from either personal experience or from proper research, then I think you've got every right to portray any so-called group as if, you know, I'm, I don't really even believe in groups, you know. I mean, this is, seems to be the, the modern idea that, you know, as a black woman, as a transgender activist, I would like, you know, it's like, I don't get that. You know, as a man, I'm not, you know, I don't think of myself as a man anymore, although I know what's saying she doesn't define herself as a woman. You know, it's just a person. And, and this fundamental humanism, which I grew up with, for me, you, you would have the, the apogee of that would be someone like James Baldwin, who is a, you know, someone who wrote about, brilliantly about being black, who wrote brilliantly about being gay, but was a, just an amazing writer and a human being, first and foremost, who wanted to write about his experience of being a human being first through those lenses. You know, and he was incredibly sympathetic to the human condition. He wasn't there to, you know, he was an angry man. He was very angry. He had every right to be angry. But always that anger was channeled through a, a kind of fundamental love for people. You know, and I think that's just that, that, that tenderness towards people at large and their flaws. Rather than raising yourself above them and looking down on them and making yourself somehow their moral superior while simultaneously their victim. I just don't find it believable as a start. So you, you mentioned before about the uh, Brisbane speech with, on uh, cultural appropriation that kind of caused a big reaction. And uh, Yasmin abdul Magid wrote in the, in the Guardian, I'm going to read a little bit of what she... Yeah. Um, she, this is a piece from, the, from uh, her article in the Guardian. She said, the reality is that those from marginalized groups, even today, do not get the luxury of defining their own place in a norm that is profoundly white, straight, and often patriarchal. And in demanding that the right to identity should be given up, Shriver epitomized the kind of attitude that led to the normalization of imperialist colonial rule. <laughs> I want this, and therefore I shall take it. So my, my question is, if we can ag agree that some groups in society have had a harder time than others, is there any responsibility <coughs> for the writer in representing those, those uh, groups accurately? And is there any truth to, to, to her response to your speech? Well, first of all, I think that woman should put me on the payroll. <laughs> um, she's been dying out me and walking out on my speech for the last two years. Um, We have a fundamental difference of opinion about what the word identity means. And that was indeed one of the points I made in that lecture. I grew up with an understanding of identity as something that you forged for yourself, perhaps with a, a lot of false starts and a lot of effort. And it was a developing project over the course of your life uh, to understand what you particularly cared about, what you loved, what you reviled, how you saw the world, how you saw your place in it, what you were good at, whom you liked. So it's a very, you notice nowhere in that list is what group do you belong in? And so I am not interested in understanding my own identity in terms of the groups into which I was born through no choice of my own. Now we're all born into a set of groups, some of them intersecting, and we all have to live with that and make our peace with that, and some of us have more trouble as a consequence of being born into those groups than others, and that's where I would agree, right? I'm not naive about certain group membership, but I don't think the answer is to seize on group membership as greater than you are and as fully defining of who you are. 
After all, if I went around saying, you know, the most important thing about me to myself is that I'm white, I'd have my head cut off, and rightly so. I don't go around saying that I, the most important thing about me is that I'm female. I, uh, I find the category of having been born, born female rather constraining. And, uh, you know, I liked, when I was growing up, I liked playing with trucks and getting dirty, and I hated wearing dresses. So I was always wanting to push the boundaries of the categories into which I was born. And in fact, my presence here today is a testimony to having pushed literal boundaries in my life, because obviously you can tell from my accent that I was born in the United States. But what did I do? I moved to Britain. I've been in the UK for the last 30 some years. So I got out. And I think my life has been a great deal more interesting as a consequence. So if that's the way that I have found my identity to break boundaries instead of recognizing them and, and, and protecting them, then why on earth would I urge other people to find themselves through, through that route? I think it's misguided, and, I, and I, I think that it doesn't, just in my experience, I, don't, I think it's unlikely to lead to a happy and centered, personally located life. Because I don't think going around saying, well, the most important thing to me, to me is that I'm black uh, is, is ultimately any more fruitful than for me to say the most important thing thing about me for, to me is that I'm white. I don't think these kinds of big baggy identities are, are a help in, in a large world with many people in it where you have to have some sense of who, who you are when you wake up in the morning. And so, you know, this young woman in Australia, uh, you know, for all I know her intentions are good. But I think this whole identity politics thing is wrong-headed, because the, the message is consistent that what you are is more important than who you are. And I, I reject that utterly. And I think who you are is more important than what you are. And that's what pushing back against racism and sexism and all the isms is all about, is seeing the person and not the category. I, yeah, we've, we've talked about this before, Tim, and the, the sense that these are good values. If you make them your primary axiom, then they can lead to madness. Like the idea of um, like diversity and inclusivity, they're, they're good values. But if you make them your primary mode of being in the world, rather than, say, the truth, for example, or, or your own uh, or um, yeah, personal growth, personal identity, striving, for example, to, to better oneself, then it becomes, yeah, you, you start, you, you go down a very difficult road. I mean, I would say as well, uh, as someone on the left, obviously you would have fought racism or you would, you would have seen racism as a problem. How do you square that, sort of holding on to some of those values of the left but not going down the route of, of identity politics and, and this kind of ideology that we're talking about? I'm having a few heretical thoughts as I sit here about the whole idea of identity politics because I, I was just trying to think. This probably doesn't answer your question, but it interests me anyway. But um, I was, it was, I come from a working class background and, and sort of, um, and I remember, you know, at, at a time when the working class were ascendant as a voice, um, on, to some extent in film and, and TV, and there were people like the angry young men in the 50s, but that was, that was, younger than me, but I mean, uh, older than me rather, and um, then, they, but then there were the kitchen sink dramas of the 60s and 70s, and the, the Ken Loach's, Kez was a film I remember, so I remember the white working class, which I suppose is my identity originally, it's not really much anymore, but it's where I came from, sorry, um, and uh, you know, I, I also remember times uh, that got today, today even, where I think of the depictions of working class people by an increasingly 
well, more today than before, actually, the depictions of working class people by middle class actors and how kind of unconvincing I find them and how annoying I find that. You know, the fact is that they're not actually using the authentic item. Uh, the most remarkable things about most portrayals of working class people in uh, television and, and um, radio, particularly something like EastEnders, is they don't swear. Whereas um, where I came from, every other fucking word was a swear word. It was almost the defining nature, and also the nature of the working class is to be extremely offensive. That was kind of a rebellious attitude towards everything. It was just like, fuck you, we don't buy into your middle class values. Anyway, I just sort of thought that makes me see more and more the kind of identity politics side of the coin. But perhaps it's a bit like blackface. You know what I mean? Like that, 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 the, 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 how, how obscene it would be to see, and of course we have Laurence Olivier doing in Othello not so many decades ago, um, the idea that, you know, at that level you can look at cultural appropriation and go, well, well you know, there is a point there. But as with all these things, you were saying, you know, it depends where you root your absolute values. Do you root, root them in, say, truth, or do you root them in identity politics? And the beauty, of course, of identity politics is it's a lot simpler. Once you sort of adopt it as a worldview, you don't really have to think anymore. You really don't, because, you know, you've got your... It, it's a very religious way of thinking, and I think that, in reality, human beings are very religious creatures. They think religiously. They think tribally, and they think religiously. They think in groups, and they like to think in groups, because the kind of ideal of my generation, which was individual autonomy and working out for yourself, is a hell of a challenge. It really is. You know, to try and work out your own values take on the burden of saying, I don't know what the hell's going on, but I'm going to try and work it out. I'm not going to, I'm going to do what the Bible tells me, and I'm not going to do what Marxism today tells me. I'm not going to do what The Guardian tells me. I'm not going to do what The Spectator tells me. I'm going to work it out. And that's a really tough call for most people, for everybody, in fact. But to have the courage to stay... And, and, and to be honest, in my mind, that is what distinguishes a proper novelist or a proper writer or a proper artist is there people who will not say and say that's true just because you tell me it's true I will not accept that I've got to work it out for myself and ask a lot of very very awkward questions and that's an uncomfortable place to be because you're constantly on the on the boundary of uncertainty and therefore on the boundary of chaos and confusion and that's a, that's a place human beings find very, very difficult. So the temptation for nearly everybody is to just join the group, whatever that group is. And that can lead, in my mind, at best, to a kind of lobotomizing of your worldview. And, and at worst, to the death camps. So, you know... We have to cleave to the ideal, even if it's not really achievable for most people. We have to cleave to the ideal of individual autonomy, individual conscience, individual understanding, individually working out what's right or wrong for us. And that's a lifelong task that tests you to the limit. But, and too many people will just hide in the group, and, and I find that deplorable, and that's what I see is happening today. Do you want to pick up, or, to pick up or shall I ask a question? Um, Tim mentioned it before, but the sense of that there are good and bad representations of people in literature. Do you? Like, there is something about a disrespectful representation of someone that seems qualitatively different from a respectful representation. Do you think that's a fair distinction to make? I mean, Tim was sort of talking about 
working class characters as if, if it, if it fe there is a sense that it could feel exploitative or it could feel um, tokenistic in some way. Well, people have been writing badly ever since there was text. So, sure, uh, there's, there's such a thing as bad dialogue and um, bad, you know, unpersuasive portrayal, portrayals. That's what Tim was talking about. Um, uh, characters that don't ring true. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. That's what, uh, that's what reviewing is, has traditionally been for. So, so this, this doesn't wash. Uh, this person doesn't seem real. I don't buy it. After all, the, but what I'm carving out is the right to try, you know, to make an effort. And that it doesn't mean that, that, that the fruits of your efforts can't be criticized. Uh, so we're, we're, we, all, we all have the right to write whatever fiction, say, that, that we like, but then we should also have the right to say, you know, that that character is ridiculous, that accent is rendered badly, that character from that particular place would never, I think, say that. You know, it's, and I don't think it's a matter of respect. I think I, I don't recognize that as respect. It has to do with a kind of professionalism or, or an ability to get away with things. I mean, fiction of every form is really sleight of hand. It's a form of fakery. And so it's a matter of persuading people that these, these characters you've made up, after they're not real, um, that they are real, that they, 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 ha they, form a, they achieve a kind of integrity in, in the audience's head that they don't really deserve. So there's a skill, there's a sneaky little skill to making people seem real. And I don't think it, it means respecting them exactly. And, it, and if you're going to make a character work, then it needs to be a very individual character and not just be some character that, that seems like a, a, a plausible representative of their, of their people, you know? needs to be someone in particular. That's one of the things that's so great about The Wire, just because that came up, good example. Those characters are very individual, and they're great, and they're memorable. And they're not just a bunch of black people being black. Uh, and so, yes, there's such a thing as being good at your job. And those are, th those are the writers that basically get away with murder because their characters no more exist than anyone else's. But they, they perform a con job uh, on the audience that is effective. And I want to sort of just, just end. We've got about five minutes before we're going to take a break. By saying, where, where does this all go? and What are you concerned about where it might go? Because it seems that there's two, there's two different attitudes that you can take to, for example, someone writing uh, a novel as a character, one of which is to say, you got wrong, or you didn't include this, you're open to that, or, well, how could I have done it better? If you have the potential to, to learn, learn more about someone else's experience, or there's the perspective of, you should not even attempt this in the first place. It seems to me that that perspective is profoundly anti-human. Like, it, it denies the possibility of empathy or of genuine communication. And what I fear is that it, it ends up with us completely siloed for each other. And that, that's very concerning. I think it may start with sort of good intentions, but what it, the place that it ends up is almost guaranteeing some form of conflict because it denies the possibility of true connection across whatever boundaries there are. So, um, I'm going to slightly sidestep that point as well. Um, though I think it's going to touch on it, um, because uh, uh, while you were talking, I was thinking about something important about a kind of direct... <laughs> Not that I'm saying what you... <laughs> and I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, <laughs> about a, a concrete example of how censorship or 
not even sensitive to the climate, cultural climate, is invidious to art. I uh, just just popped into my head. Unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the program. It was a drama that was on a year or two back about a, a about a man and a woman, showing from both the man and the woman's point of view about who had been telling the truth about whether she was raped or not. Liar, liar, I think it was called. No, it's called, I think it's called Liar, Liar. Maybe something like, something like that. Um, anyway, in the end, it turned out the guy was lying. Um, and there was a piece in the Spectator which I thought was absolutely right. He said, of course the guy was lying. They could not have ended it any other way. It would not have been allowed. And that's what worries me. Because once you start having that thread in the culture that, you know, it just becomes boring. There was a kind of time when black characters were represented in movies as pimps and gangsters. You know, we had to move beyond that. Then they became represented always as good guys. And it's like, okay, and which is kind of where we somewhat stayed, you know. I think we need to get a point where we say these are all people, you know, and you can get, you know, there are bad people in every single, there are disabled bad people. You know, incredibly. I'll make a fascinating transgender point. I have no opinion about transgender matters, he says self defensively but I was doing a fascinating piece. I've not, I've not done anything with this piece of information. I haven't, and, and uh, I'd probably be scared to. Um, but I, I was, uh, when I was, I also did a, gar, a, a column for The Guardian until recently, and about my family, and one of the things that came up was bullying. And um, there was a survey that, so I, I found a big survey on bullying, you know, that they did they did recent years. So. I can't remember who ran it, but it was a big survey. And you know, they, then they broke it down to say, are you male? Are you female? Are you gay? Are you trans? You know, and, um, and you know, and, and they asked some questions like, have you been bullied? And they would also ask questions like, have you bullied anybody? And that was the interesting question. Because, uh, and this is what I haven't seen followed up anywhere, and anyone who's a journalist here may feel free to do so, is that they found out that, you know, boys were slightly more likely to bully than girls. It was something like, you know, quite high. It was like something about, you know, 20, 30% of boys and girls admitted privately that they had bullied another person. And, and gay people were roughly the same. Uh, trans kids were like 75% of them said that they had bullied, which I thought was absolutely remarkable. You know, and I thought and I, that was not what I'd expected at all in that survey. They'd also said that a huge number had been bullied, but that they had also bullied. And that just made me think, you know what, with every group you find, it's full of people who are, have a dark side, you know, and if you can't portray that dark side, in the interest of some airbrushed view of reality, then you are selling out art, you are selling out truth, you are selling out literature, you're selling out drama, you're selling out TV, you're selling out films, you're selling out what is the most important thing we've got in this culture, which is a love of the truth and love of reality. So, um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> So if Tim won't answer my question, you answer my question of where, where does this go? Are you concerned about what the kind of the natural end point of this way of thinking is? Well, obviously it's getting worse. Um, so I have no reason to believe that it's not going to continue to get worse. Though cheerfully, I sometimes theorize that the way out of this is catastrophe. Because... Look, this is petty shit, right? It's definitely what they call first world problems. It's a, a product of prosperity. In fact, if you take a look at most of the people in these identity politics uh, movement, it's, they're pretty well off. The kids of middle, the middle class, or the upper middle class. This is not actually a working class movement at all. So these are a bunch of people who are, dare I say it, privileged. 
Okay? So what we need to shut them up is something like a nuclear bomb going off or climate change taking out a whole continent. Something really crap to put things in perspective. And then I dare say that's the last you ever hear of microaggression. So, thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Tim. We're going to take about a 20-minute break, and then we'll come back for a Q&A. We did actually manage to get the live stream working, so there were a hundred or so people watching and commenting and etc. And also clapping with emoticons at the same time you guys were clapping, but with the delay. So that was, that was good. Um, so we're going to uh, start with actually one of the live stream questions from uh, Tanga. And the question is, um, and any, I suppose anyone can answer it, whoever feels called to. The question is, should the people who are thought policing be engaged with, argued with, or should they just be completely ignored and left in their own bubbles to kind of fizzle out? I, I, would, I find it very difficult to talk to these people. Uh, they don't tend to be inclined toward listening. They're very shouty and... I think that's why we were probably best off not having someone um, from the quote other side uh, at this event tonight. Um, I mean, I do think these conversations are worth having, but uh, there is a there is this. I mean, this whole safe spaces mentality is has to do with an inability to listen to a position that is obnoxious to them. I mean, they can't, they, that is regarded as a form of assault, the, someone else's opinion with which they don't agree. You know, if they calm down, I think we should invite them over. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of with Lionel. I mean, I just, you know, it's a very despairing thing for somebody who believes in free discourse to say. But, you know, I have sort of slightly sad personal experience of this in some ways because my daughter, who's now 25, um, went to university, quite a good university, Leeds. And um, I was, you know, very excited that she would come out with this amazing critical mind and open thinking and was so depressed when she came back. It was just her mind had closed completely. And, you know, she had no concept whatsoever that there might be anything else. I mean, perhaps this has been true of students forever, I don't know. But, I mean, I found it very depressing. You know, that there was all the channels of communication had closed down and, and it was just, you know, maybe it was a father-daughter thing. I don't know. But I don't think so. You know, and, and I found it terrifying. And if that's what universities are doing, to people, um, and I ain't paying the tuition fees anymore, that's for sure. <laughs> so we'll take some questions from people in the audience. Very fast hand to go up. So I'm just going to repeat uh, part of the question for the, the viewers on the live stream. And John, your point was... Joe, sorry, Joe. Joe, your point was that there's a different. there seems to be a difference between cultural appropriation and racial appropriation. Racial appropriation is what seems to really um, create a big, a big reaction. I actually think that's pretty well observed. Uh, that's, it does seem to be much more about race than anything else. Um, after all, uh, when men dress up as women or women dress up as men, we're think, supposed to think that's great. I guess that's a kind of gender cultural appropriation, right? So it, it is quite specific to race. The trouble is, if we're going to, if we're going to establish this idea that you own your racial culture, let's call it for what it is, your racial culture. First off, of course, we have the problem of mixed race people. I mean, what do they own? 
um, where do they belong, what is theirs, and furthermore, if you own your racial culture, then why can't I turn around and say, well, then black people can't use an iPhone, right? Invented by white people. You can't play Beethoven, you know? You can't read Dickens. It's mine. It belongs to me. It's white people's culture. Now, turn that around, I, I hope you can hear how utterly absurd that sounds. And also, ungenerous, ugly. You know, I don't want to own my culture, and you know what? I didn't invent my culture. It doesn't belong to me because I just inherited it. I didn't earn it. You know, it came to me. And I will try to honor it by reading Dickens, you know, or listening to Beethoven, or using my iPhone. <laughs> um, but, but I don't want to limit myself to that culture because it isn't supposed to be a prison. And in fact, my culture belongs to everyone. And there is no such thing as one culture and another culture. They blend all together. The borders are completely fluid. That's the way it ought to be. And one of the reasons that major cities in, in all around the world are such dynamic places to be is that those cultures are furiously interacting. So we do not thrive even economically by putting a fence around ourselves and protecting our intellectual, cultural, artistic property. None of this stuff believe, belongs to us. It's all borrowed. We came into it and we're gonna have to give it up when we leave. So I think that we need to encourage a sense of generosity. You know, I'm not a, I, you know, I have some problems with the whole concept of multiculturalism just because it comes with mass migration, which I, I don't want to get into that, but it, it's associated with mass migration in a way that hasn't always had a positive impact. But at core, the concept of multiculturalism is sound. That is, it's this big interaction. We run into each other. We share ideas. We share the things we make. And we're, both of us, you know, we're, we're all uh, enriched as a consequence. And that's what's so utterly wrongheaded about this cultural appropriation nonsense. And I honestly do believe, you know, whether or not we get our, our upcoming catastrophe um, that cures us of all ills, um, this is an example of something that is not going to survive and, it, it, and will later be held up as an example of the ludicrous excesses of our era. So, um, first, I think it's 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 it is unlike unlike we're talking about um, how the whole idea of of the war on art might be a bit of a fringe activity. The obsession of a small group of sociology students and ac people in academe, and um, I think we rejected the idea that it was much more serious than that. Cultural appropriation, on the other hand, I think genuinely is quite a fringe issue. I don't think anybody really worries that much about it, except quite a small number of people in the universities. Having said that, I think there was a time when it was a, quite a valid concept. And when I think of Elvis Presley coming along and you know taking basically black music and making a fortune out of it, while all the people who were Chuck Berry and so forth were just sc scrubbing along on pennies because all the white record executives were just taking their money and, 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 and the same with blues men, you know, ripping them off and leaving them Isn't with... Isn't that an economic injustice rather than a, a, an evil stealing problem? No, I take your point. I, I, I just think that uh, firstly I can speak louder than you because I have the mic, which I think is it. <laughs> and that has to be taken into account. And... Um, <laughs> Also, I think it's in some ways a, a fine point because the people, the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the fact is the white people had the economic power 
in the 1950s. And they had the means of production, if you like, and they had the means of, of dissemination. And black people didn't have that possibility. And, you know, there, it is quite hard to resist the feeling they were ripped off, big they time. Were ripped off. Um, and you can call that an economic argument if you like, but you could also call it a cultural argument. You could also call it a matter of cultural appropriation. But I think those times have really passed, you know, and I don't think, I think now the idea of, of you know, world, since world mu music has come and the whole idea of us borrowing from other cultures universally is pretty widely accepted as a positive thing. I think it's quite a small group of people, I would think, who actually it. I mean, I could be wrong. I just want to note the fact that during the break, I was talking to somebody who is in a literary agency and is constantly having to deal with this whole cultural appropriation all the time. So it seems to me that maybe it's not as small and confined to a tiny group as you may think. I'll put you in touch. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, we'll take a question there. So Charlie Brown's question <laughs> is, is this, is this a unique time or is this just, it always feels like this, that there are always these taboos in our culture, it's just that they've sort of shifted into different places. Is this a particular Salem witch trial kind of moment? Well, I think we are obviously dealing with the results of secularism, of which I am a big proponent, but I'm afraid that we're, you know, the, the group we're talking about is in the grip of, of a kind of evangelical fervor. And, you know, to be fair, we're dealing with the mostly younger people who are thirsty for purpose and... And faith, you know, and, you know, a, a, a reason to be in the world, a, a, a guiding principle to tell them what to do. I mean, I'm not, a, I am profoundly secular and therefore I don't tend to subscribe to a catechism of any kind. And my general answer to that thirst is, well, you know, I'm, I think you're, you're on an individual journey. And that uh, to subscribe to a catechism is a is a shortcut that cheats you, but it is very seductive. And you know, religion offers a lot of things. It it it, it offer, offers community, and this particular religion also offers an enemy. And it you know, far be it from me to decry people's. Uh, eagerness to believe in something, but my biggest problem with this identity politics movement is that it is too negative. It is too fired by, if you will, a word I read 50 to 100 times a day, hatred, okay? It has too much of a need to demonize. It is a very predatory movement, and it thrives on taking people down. And I don't like the generational element either. It, you know, it's become um, young pe people versus old people in a creepy way. Uh, I grew up with some of that stuff, that old don't trust people under 30 nonsense. And we got over it. Um, yeah, don't tr Yeah, actually, <laughs> that's interestingly misremembered. <laughs> That's, uh, that's someone over 30 remembering that phrase. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't like the hostility. I don't like the venom and um, the need for anger and righteous indignation. It is the... the you know, Tim may talk about how we're all awful, and sure we are, but some of us are more awful than others. And, um, <laughs> and you, you know, this religious movement is capable of bringing out elements that might otherwise be ameliorated if it, the ideology were otherwise. But the, I just, I really don't like this viciousness 
and you see it on Twitter all the time. And, and it's the people who are the most vicious, who get the most attention. And um, it's one of the reasons I s I'm not on Twitter. Uh, because why would I want to paint a bullseye on my forehead? But uh, as a religion, I find it wanting. And the other, the other thing that, that it, it's wanting is that it's calling people to embrace their own weakness. It, it is, I mean, it's become totally trite to talk about the exaltation of victimhood. So that's taken as a given. But it, it means that you incentivize people to, to identify with their own um, degradation, that their, their own oppression, and to embrace that oppression lest they become powerlessness. It's become this weird flipped thing so that the most, people who have the most oppression are the, the most exalted. And I, you know, I just don't think that's the answer. Um, that has not been the answer in my life. For example, I mean, the only thing I might cling to on the victimhood front is being female and it has not, you know, that has not made my life being treated like shit because I'm a woman and being underestimated because of a woman. I'm a woman, it's been, you know, I want to be remembered for my books and maybe for events like this one, but not because my father never expected me to become very important. You know, I got over that. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's taken sort of this long before the word religion has kind of been brought up because... Um, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting part of this kind of this this ideology that it does seem very religious in tone. And I know you mentioned something like that when we did a, our interview a, a few months ago. Yeah, I mentioned it earlier this evening as well. But I mean, and the question, uh, no, well, that's uh, no, it's, it's, it's mutual. Um, uh, the gentleman mentioned Salem, of course, which is um, a witch trial conducted by the church. Um, and Arthur Miller wrote, uh, of course, The Crucible, based on the Salem witch trials, um, which is a kind of... S and he wrote it, obviously, as a rejoinder to what was happening in McCarthyism in America at the time. And it's all... Really, there's two kinds of religion. There's the declared religions and the undeclared religions. Um, secularism is another kind of declared, undeclared religion in some ways. Um, uh, and uh, certainly the social justice warriors and the uh, radical left um, have always been an, a, a kind of undeclared religion, um, whether it's uh, Mao or Stalin or, or Marx or Hitler. You know, Nietzsche pointed out in the 19th century that once God died that, uh, you know, what was going to rise up to fill the void was, um, was more terrible than religion ever came up with. And, and that was true. It was religion without God. And that's still what we're seeing. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing people scrabbling around to find faith in something. Only they don't call it faith. They call it justice. They call it equity. They call it identity, but it's religion. It's quite simply a religion. It's a religion because, and that's why, as Lionel said, when you're trying to debate with these people, you won't get any further than debating with the Reverend Ian Paisley, you know, because you're, you're, you're debating with people who've already made up their mind. You know, and I've spent all my life not making up my mind. Why the hell can't other people? <laughs> You know, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, why are people so arrogant as to think they know what the hell's going on? Nobody knows what the hell's going on. Certainly not me. You know, and, um, and these people swaggering around, going about how they know this is right and this is wrong and this is right and this is wrong. Well, fuck off. <laughs> so, uh, Bianca had her hand up earlier. So Bianca's question is about quotas within the TV industry, for example, 20% of all um, leading roles going to BA, ME um, characters, for example. Well, 
Well, it, 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 it troubles me. I can sort of see the principle that one should um, try and make the figures stack up. Though they seem to be going quite a long way beyond stacking up, as far as I can make out. But I mean, you know, if there are 12% ethnic minorities in the country, then in a fair society, there would be 12% of mainstream actors. It's, I think I think it's way beyond that actually now. But I mean, um, and it seems to be a sort of uh, kind of counter reaction to the idea of of, of the domination of. Uh, white and majority culture for so many years. So I can see that argument. What, what, what worries me, I suppose, is, the, is, is, is that it's replacing something ineffable and unquantifiable with something quantifiable and measurable. And art isn't quantifiable and measurable. The trouble is, in other words, it's threatening quality. And who can say what quality is? I, I don't know what quality is. I know it when I see it, but I don't know what it is. And there was once a, a, a culture at, say, the BBC, where there's a kind of a, a group of producers, often mavericks, and you know some of them were mavericks, some of them weren't, but there was a lot, bunch of interesting people who had the license to just go, hmm, that's an interesting piece of work. We should run that, you know, because it's an interesting piece of work. Now you can't defend what an interesting piece of work is. It's it's like saying. You know, prove to me that Picasso was a great artist. I mean, I can't prove it to you. Um, whereas, if I can say, you know, how's the how's the, how's the BAME representation going? So, well, I could show you statistics on that. You know, and that becomes measurable, and it's enormously comforting to people of a bureaucratic mindset um, to have something measurable. So that's. That's my more general and high-minded reason for posing it. The other one is that when um, they were out trying to sell the screenplay of my new novel, it's like we're not interested in anybody who is a white middle-aged man. Um, no, one's, no one wants to look at it. They're interested in Bane writers, they're interested in women, but if you think you're going to get your book you know, adapted, you've got, you know, it's just it's not going to happen. Now, that's my selfish reason. It's like, well, that seems a bit unfair. Um, could be a shit book. I don't know. But then, and it might, could, could, be an ex, could be expression. But, but the idea that, that um, putting myself aside, and not something I like to do, but uh, if, I, if I did momentarily, before we come back to me again, um, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would really worry that this idea of, this very intangible idea of, that, that is lodged in, in a... In a in a culture impossible to quantify that there's a kind of and it's very elitist that's the problem it's very elitist because it, it relies on certain people with what we also can't quantify called taste you know and, uh, and, and artistic sensitivity and, and, and cultural insight can't measure any of these things you know there was, it was just it's just once upon a time people take a crack at it just because it was interesting. And now we're in a place where we can, we can, you know, it's part of the box ticking culture where we can say, you know, well, was that series any good? Who cares whether it was any good? You know, it had the following characteristics. And I can, you know, why are you asking me if it's any good? I mean, that's not the point. Is it? You know, yeah, it is the fucking point. So, I think we've got time for two more questions. So, I think you had your hand up before. Sorry. You can uh, sure. So, I mean, thank you for this. It's been really interesting. And I agree with a lot of what you say. I agree we need nuance, we need truth, all of that. Um, and we need complexity and openness. But I think the, other, the concern I have is sometimes um, we're talking about this, we're ignoring the real dangers that there are in the world right now. Um, of, for example, when you talk about arts, you're both artists that come to it from a place of good faith. You're here, you're trying to write and to create art in a way that's getting to a greater truth. But there are people who use art in a very different way. And one example of that obviously is, is you know, the thing we've just seen about Grenfell. That's arguably a piece of art, which is done in order to incite hatred. And that's something that we're seeing, it's growing and it's dangerous. And if you come from a background that, because it, it creates hatred and we've seen in the past. Okay, fine. 
Why is that dangerous? <laughs> okay. Um, if you're if you come from a community which is going which is which is going to be the subject of hate because it helps repel someone else in Trump's case, for example, a, a populist, you can become demonized. And we know in other countries what happens when you demonize people. If you look at Rwanda, the use of demonizing certain groups was used to strengthen other groups, and that ultimately led to violence. That's the lesson of history. So I, I, I mean, for me seeing that kind of thing happen without recognizing the dangers inherent in that is problematic. Okay, let me just get this straight. You don't think that burning a paper representation of a building is going to lead to uh, our, our macheteing each other in the streets? With respect, I'm speaking to you with respect, and I'm listening to everything you're saying. I believe in a lot of what you're saying, but you know that it's not as simple as that, right? You know that, that, that you start off by mocking people, by making them less, by making them the target of, of hate in some way. And yeah, a burning, burning a piece of art is a way of, of, of minimizing them, of making them, of making them um, uh, some, it, it demonstrates them being less than other parts of the community. It's, it's an easy way of, 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 of transferring um, kind of uh, distracting people from what you're doing by, by demonizing this other group. And that and art can be used in that way. And you can laugh at that. But it isn't you art. can You can it's laugh. Propaganda. Right, but art, that's the problem, though, isn't it? Isn't, isn't, isn't a piece of art. Yeah, but that's your perception. But that's your perception. That's your perception. Okay. All right, I'm going to go out on a limb here, unusually. Um, I found that case very interesting. Now, it isn't really a piece of art, but let's say it was. You know, let's call it a piece of art. I mean, maybe they think of it as art. It's an arbitrary category. The question is whether or not those, I think it was mostly kids, wasn't it? Was, it, was, it, was some adults too? Okay. All right. I, I don't even care who did it. Interestingly, no, interestingly, the cops are unable to pin any crime on these people. It's not a hate crime because it, that, that disaster did not be belong to one of those specific protected categories of people. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting case. Um, now look, I am the first person to admit that it was an excruciatingly poor taste but I think it should be legal. I don't think those people should be in jail. And we could call it a piece of art. We could call it just an act of, of, of demonstrating how thick and crass you are. But it's not illegal to be thick. God, most of Britain would be in jail. <laughs> and it's not illegal to be crass. It's not, believe it or not, illegal to be racist. And I think that's one of the things we have to get our heads around. Because, you know, we all have prejudices. We all, we all approach each other with little categories in our minds and little preconceived notions. Sometimes they're, they're too positive. Oh, you know, the Asian over there, he's so good at math. Um, and that's a kind of prejudice. Uh, but prejudice is not against the law. And I think we are, we are losing a distinction between social decency, which we would all like each other to display, uh, and therefore social indecency and criminality. And it's not the place of the state to enforce social decency. We, we all have a right to have an opinion about these people who put together that model and thought it was so hilarious. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't decry it, it was not funny. It was a very poor joke. It was ugly. So I'm not defending it, but I don't want them arrested. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question, I think, and it, it's a, it goes to the heart of a lot of things that make me uneasy. Um, and I don't think it's simple, because one can remember back to the 30s and Der Sturmer and the Nazi press who were publishing articles that vilified 
Jews, they're this you know, sending, burning down Grenfell is not the same thing, but I can, it, it's part of the spectrum of the argument that if one allows hate out there, it's going to have some terrible consequences. Um, and it's always a question of balancing these rights. I have to say I'm 100% behind um, Lionel in, in the idea that this is, this is you know, vile and pathetic. But when I heard that six people had been arrested over it, it really sent chills up my spine. I mean, for fuck's sake. You know, this is, this is, you can't have the police going around some stupid guy who's, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, it's also part of the, the, what you might call the shift in the definition of hurt. You know, and I'm sure if I had a relative at Grenfell who died at Grenfell, I'd be extremely hurt by what they had done and offended and, and upset. Um... But I just can't live with that definition of hurt. I can't live with it. I don't think we can live with it as a society. Because once we go down that road of psychological hurt amounting to a crime, I just don't see where that ends. You know, And I, I, I just think you're on a terrifying road. I mean, I really sympathise with anyone who lost someone in that building to having to watch that. But as, as Lionel says, there are... There are crude, stupid, and, and, and wicked people out there, and we can't lock them all up. Um, and and, and, I, and that, that, that whole, you know, I, I, I mean, if they, they were, you know, and it's, it's not an easy answer. I mean, I, there was that story about Count Dankula and his dog that did the Nazi salute. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know, there was something about that that made me uneasy as well. I don't mean uneasy because... He was, a, he was arrested. I mean, I was definitely uneasy about that, but I was also very uneasy about what he was doing. Not so much teaching a dog a Nazi salute, but it was what he was said. He said, gas the Jews. And it was like, there was something about that phrase that I found... Did that turn out pretty well, Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, it wasn't like, it wasn't even I hate the Jews. It was gas the Jews. You know, it seems such an extreme... It doesn't sit... No, I'm sure. But I'm sure to, to it's better than gas the Jews somehow, you know. Keep an eye, keep an eye on him. Yeah, I mean, uh, the trouble is, you do, you do have to, you do have to put up with a lot of, as Lionel said, a lot of assholes in the world, you know, and you can't lock them all up. And uh, and I think once you start locking them, and also there's always the problem of who's an asshole, you know, who defines an asshole, you know, and um, and once you've got, you know, you at the moment we've got a, a, a political climate that is quite stringently, I would say, you know, left wing in terms of social positioning but if you switch that and and it was the right wing who were defining what was acceptable and what wasn't i think you would be you know in dangerous ground if you if you had someone like a, if you had someone like um donald trump you know who's uh, america is protected by free speech laws which we're not um saying you know well i find it offensive that you that you present that you present these left-wing opinions against abortion for instance or in favor of abortion and I want to suppress that view because I consider it to be wrong and immoral and in favour of murdering people, even though they're very small, you know, incipient people. Who's doing the defining? You know, and I think that's that's the real danger. But I take your point completely, and I, you know, I, I it's a horrible thing. But between justice and the law, there's quite a big gap, I think. But thank you for the question. So we are at quarter to ten, so I think we're going to have to end the Q&A here. But there's been, yeah, there's a lot of energy in the room, and I think we definitely should uh, do more of these events. So um, I'm going to finish by saying thank you very much to Lionel Shriver. <laughs> and also to, is it, it's Tim, isn't it? <laughs> and to Tim. And, and we, have, we have another event here in exactly two weeks' time, which is with Ian McGilchrist, the uh, writer of The Master and His Emissary. And that will also be live-streamed, if we can get it working. Uh, is it working now? 
Great. And goodbye to everyone on the live stream. Turn around and say, wave goodbye to everyone on the live stream. Thank you very much for coming. It's been great. Thank you.